Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to the second day of NGINXConf. Uh, my name is Chris Stetson, and I'm the head of professional services and also the microservices practice lead. Um, we're going to be talking about microservices today and how to build a fast, secure network system uh, using NGINX. Um, We'll even have a demo at the end uh, to show you how, uh, with our partners from Sockets, to build a, a fabric model-based uh, microservice application very quickly and easily. So look forward to that. All right. <clears throat> um, before we dive into the fabric model, I want to talk about microservices uh, and what it means from an NGINX perspective. Um, Microservices has caused a big shift uh, in the way applications are architected. Back in the day when I first started building uh, applications, um, they were all pretty much the same. This monolith uh, that you see on the screen here is emblematic of, of the way that, that applications were constructed. You had a, a VM of some sort. I often used Java. Your functional components of the application would exist in the VM as objects. They would talk to each other in memory. They would have you know, handles back and forth, calling, making method calls. Occasionally, you would reach out to other systems you know, to get data or, or uh, pass out information, notifications, that sort of thing. With microservices, the paradigm for how applications are constructed is completely different. Um, your functional components have shifted from being on the, the same host in memory, you know, talking through a VM, to living on containers and uh, being uh, and connecting to each other through HTTP um, using RESTful calls, API calls. This is very powerful because it gives you functional isolation. It gives you much more granular scalability. Um, and you get resiliency to better deal with failure. Uh, and a lot of this is, is simply enabled by the fact that, that you're making calls uh, across the, the network using HTTP. But there are some downsides to it. Now, I have a deep, dark secret. I was a Microsoft employee, and I did .NET development for many years. Um, while I was there, <laughs> thank you. Um, while I was there, I built uh, their video publishing platform called Showcase. Uh, it was the system that took all the videos that, that Microsoft published internally and, and put them out on the web so people could, could view them and learn how to uh, do tips and tricks with Microsoft Word, for example. Um, it was a very popular platform. We had you know, a lot of people who used it. They would comment on, on the videos that we published. All well and good. It was a .NET map monolith to start with, and as the popularity of the system became, uh, you know, grew, we, we decided that we should change it to an SOA architecture. The conversion was relatively easy. Um, you know, uh, Visual Studio gives you a capability to essentially flip a switch and your DLL calls shift to uh, RESTful API calls. With some, some minor refactoring, we were able to get our code to work reasonably well. Um, we were also using the Intelligent Community uh, Server for our, our comments and community features within the application. Um, the, the instruction said, yes, we are SOA capable. And, and certainly in our first initial tests, it seemed to work fine. Um, it wasn't until we actually moved the system to our staging environment and we're using production data that we saw some serious problems. The problems were around uh, pages with a lot of comments. We, you know, this was a very popular platform. We had some pages with as many as 2,000 comments on them. We realized as we were digging into this problem that, that uh, the reason that these pages were taking over a minute to render was because the Intelligent Community Server was uh, populating the, the uh, user names uh, first by having the user ID in the page and then doing a network call for every user ID back to the user database to get that name and populate it on the rendered page. Um, this was uh, brutal. And it was taking, as I mentioned, uh, a minute or two to render pages that, in memory, normally took uh, you know, five to six seconds. 
So as we went through the process, we, we eventually shimmed the, uh, the system and uh, did things like group all the requests. We cached some of the data, and, and ultimately, we ended up optimizing the network to really uh, improve the performance around it. Um, so what does this mean for microservices? Well, with microservices, you're essentially taking an SOA architecture and you're putting it into hyperdrive. Um, all the objects that were contained on you know, this single VM and managed in internally talking to each other in memory are now using HTTP to exchange the data. When this is done right, you get very good performance and linear scalability. And obviously, from Nginx's perspective, this is a good thing. Um, why? Because we can help you do it right. Uh, a little history about, about Nginx and microservices. Um, we've been involved in the microservice movement from the very beginning. Uh, we're, we are the number one downloaded application from Docker Hub. Um, our customers and, and users who have the largest, some of the largest uh, microservice installations in the world use us extensively within their, their infrastructure. And the reason is because we, have, uh, we are small, fast, and reliable. We've also been working on, on microservices internally at, uh, at, at Nginx for a while now. Um, you see here a, a stylized context diagram of our uh, reference architecture that we've been building. The system uh, currently runs on AWS. We have six core microservices. They all run in Docker containers. Uh, we decided to build them as a polyglot application, so each container runs with a different language. We're using Ruby, Python, PHP, Java, and Node. Um, we built it using uh, the 12-factor app approach. We modified some of the, the, the uh, principles of the 12-factor app to, to make it work more for microservices as just instead of the Heroku platform. Um, and we'll be showing you guys uh, the application actually running in the demo a little bit later. Now, why are we doing this? Why did we build this reference architecture? We built it because we wanted to provide our customers with a blueprint for building microservices. We also wanted to test out Nginx uh, and Nginx Plus features within the context of microservices and figure out how we can use it to better advantage. And we also wanted to understand uh, the microservices ecosystem and what, what that can provide you. Um, and with that, we're going to be showing, you know, uh, having the demo with one of our, our partners who we've been working with very closely recently. All right, so let's go back to that, that architecture change that I mentioned before, the big shift. Um, uh, with the, the transition from having all of your functional components of your application running in memory and being managed by the VM to working over a network and talking to each other, you've essentially introduced a series of problems that you need to address um, in order for the, the application to work efficiently. One, you need to do service discovery. Two, you're going to need to do load balancing between all the different instances. And three, you need to worry about performance and security. And unfortunately, those go hand in hand and, and you have to balance them together. Hopefully, we'll have a, a, a solution that addresses all of these. So let's, let's look at these in, in more depth. The service discovery problem. OK, in the monolith, um, the app engine would manage all of the uh, object relations. You never had to worry about where you know, one object was versus another. You just simply made a method call. It would, would, the VM would connect you to the object instance, and, and away it would go. In microservices, you need to think about where those services are. And unfortunately, um, it is not a universal process. The, the various service registries that you're using, whether it's Zookeeper, Console, etcd, whatever it is, all work in different ways. And this process, in this process, you need to register your, your uh, uh, services, and you need to be able to read where those services are and be able to connect to them. The second problem is uh, around load balancing. And when you have multiple instances of a service, you want to be able to connect to them easily and be able to distribute your requests across them efficiently and do it in the quickest possible manner. And so 
Um, that is, uh, load balancing between the different instances is a, is a very important problem. Unfortunately, load balancing in its simplest form is pretty dumb. Um, and as you get more complicated and start using different schemes for doing load balancing, it, it, it also becomes more complicated and, and sophisticated. Um, and ideally, you want to your, your uh, developers to be able to decide how to do the load balancing scheme based on, on the needs of their application. So for example, if you're connecting back to a stateful application, you want to have persistence so that you can make sure that your session information is retained. And this is perhaps the most daunting aspect of microservice design, performance and security. When everything was running in memory, a as I mentioned before, and I think you know, part of this is my own scarring from that experience, but you know, uh, when everything was, was uh, working in memory, it was all very fast. And it's now going over the network, which is an order of magnitude slower. This information you know, that was securely contained in, in uh, a single system and that was typically in a binary format is now being flung across the network in text format. So it's relatively easy to put a sniffer on the network and be able to listen to all that data of your application being moved around. If you want to encrypt the data at the transmission layer, you introduce significant overhead in terms of, of uh, connection rates and CPU usage. SSL, in its full implementation, requires nine steps just to initiate a single request. And with our system, you know, when your system is doing thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of requests a day, this becomes a significant imp impediment to performance. Some of the solutions we've been, we've been developing at Nginx, we think address all of these, giving you robust service discovery, really good load balancing and, and user configurable load balancing, and secure uh, and fast encryption. All right, let's talk about the various ways that you can set up a, uh, and configure your network architectures. Um, we've come up with three network models. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive per se, um, but we think that they, they uh, pair out into to various formats. The three models are the proxy model, the router mesh model, and the fabric model. Now, the fabric model is the most complex and, and in many ways turns load balancing on its head. So we're going to spend the most amount of time on that. Um, so let's get into it. OK, the proxy model. This model focuses entirely on inbound traffic to your uh, microservice uh, application and really ignores internal communication. You get all of the goodness that, uh, of HTTP traffic management that Nginx provides. You can have SSL termination. You can have traffic shaping and security. And with the latest version of, of Nginx Plus, you get a uh, WAF capability with mod security. You can have caching. You can all add all the things that, that Nginx provides your monolithic application with uh, your microservice system. And with Nginx Plus, we are able to do uh, service discovery, so as your instances of your APIs uh, come up and down, Nginx Plus can dynamically add and subtract those to the load balancing tool. The router mesh model is uh, like the, the uh, proxy model in that we have a, 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 a front-end proxy server to manage that incoming traffic. But it also adds a centralized load balancing between the services. You connect to the, the uh, each of the services will connect to that centralized router mesh, and that will manage the dis distribution of, of uh, connections between the different services. Um, the router mesh model also allows you to build in the circuit breaker pattern so that, that you can add resiliency to your application and, and do things that, that will allow you to, to monitor and, and pull back on, uh, on instances of your services that are, are failing. Um, unfortunately, because it adds an extra hop, if, you're, if you have to do SSL encryption, it actually uh, exacerbates the performance problem, which is where the fabric model comes into play. Um, as I mentioned, the fabric model is, uh, is 
the, the model that sort of flips everything on its head. And like the two other models before it, you have that proxy server in the front to manage the, the incoming traffic. But where it differs from the, uh, from the router mesh is that instead of a centralized router, you have uh, Nginx Plus running in every container. And this, con this Nginx Plus instance acts as a reverse and forward proxy to all of the HTTP traffic. Using this system, you get dynamic, uh, you get service discovery, robust load balancing, and most importantly, um, high performance encrypted networking. So we'll go into how that happens and, and uh, how we make that work. Let's start by looking at, at a normal process for, uh, for how services connect and, and distribute their request structures. Um, in this diagram, you see the investment manager uh, needs to talk to the user manager to get, to get information. Um, the investment manager will create a, an HTTP client. Uh, that client will do a DNS request against the service registry and get back an IP address. <coughs> um, it will then initiate that SSL connection to the, the, uh, to the user manager which will go through that nine-step process. Once the data is transferred, the VM will, will close down the connection and garbage collect that HTTP client. So that's the process. You know, it's a fairly straightforward one. I think most people have understand it. When you break it down into these steps, you see the, the, what it takes to actually make that re request and response process. In the, in the Fabric model, we change that around a bit. Um, the first thing you'll notice is that Nginx is running in each of the services, and the application code talks locally to Nginx Plus. Because these are local host connections, uh, you don't have to worry about them being encrypted. They can be uh, HTTP requests from the Java code to the, uh, to the DNS and the PHP or to the, the Nginx Plus uh, instance. And the PHP code can do the same. So it's all uh, HTTP locally within the container. Um, you'll also notice that, that Nginx Plus is managing the, the connection to the service registry. We have a resolver that goes through uh, uh, and asynchronously queries the, the DNS uh, instance of the registry to get all of the instances of the user manager and establish connections, pre-establish connections so that, that the Java service, when it needs to request some data from the user manager, will use a pre-existing uh, uh, connection. But here's where the real benefit comes in. In the stateful, persistent, encrypted connections between the microservices. Remember in that first diagram how the service instance uh, goes through the process of creating the HTTP client, negotiating the SSL connection, making the request, and closing it down? Here, Nginx will pre-establish the connection between the microservices, and using keep alive functionality, keep that, that connection persistent between calls so that you don't have to do that, that, uh, that Re that, that SSL negotiation process for each request. Essentially, we're creating mini VPN connections uh, from service to service. In our initial testing, we found that, that there's a 77% increase in connection speed between the two. You also get the benefit of, of the ability to create and, and use the uh, circuit breaker pattern within the the fabric model and in the router mesh model. And essentially, you define uh, an active health check within your, your service and uh, set up caching so that, that you can retain data in case the service becomes unavailable, giving you the full uh, circuit breaker functionality. All right, so this fabric model thing sounds, sounds pretty cool, and I'm sure you'd like to see it in action. Um, one of the nice things is that we've been working with our, uh, our partners at Sockets who have helped us build a, a system to easily visualize, control, and uh, automate the process of building uh, microservice 
fabric model applications. I'd like to uh, introduce Seo Chang, who's the CTO of Zockets. He's going to come up and, and help us uh, show off the fabric model and their platform. All right, so right now, uh, Seo is, is showing us the, uh, their control plane and the, uh, the ability to, to drag and drop uh, actual containers onto their platform and, uh, and create the, the fabric model of our uh, version of the reference architecture on their system. Um, he's dragged out the pages web uh, controller and another of the uh, resizer application. Um, he's now going to bring out the auth proxy system, uh, which is that proxy model version of the, the environment. And you'll see that it's connected to the, uh, to the internet. And using introspection, the Sockets platform has seen that the, the uh, auth proxy connects to the pages and the resizer system, and each of those is connecting to a Redis database. We're going to switch over to a, a fully rendered version of the, the microservices reference architecture, and you can see that the system uh, has uh, connections between all of the, the different systems. The green lines indicate that we have SSL connection between all of the, the systems. Um, you can also see the, the the green numbers there indicating the number of instances we have uh, and the traffic information between the services is listed at the top. Sayo is now going to show off the, uh, the status view that, that comes uh, with Nginx. And this gives you an ability to, to look at each of the containers and find out the traffic patterns within the, the systems. Um, and you can see that, that uh, the systems are connected and, and routing traffic back and forth. One of the nice things that, that the Sockets uh, platform provides is an ability to actually get into the containers and, and see what's happening internally. Uh, sales bringing up a fully functional uh, CLI, uh, 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 CLI into a bash script, in, a bash shell into the, the container so we can see the specifics of the, the uh, Nginx configuration and be able to run commands internally within the, the, the system. All right. So uh, thank you for, for coming and, and taking a look at our, our, uh, the Fabric model and learning about Nginx uh, performance. We are, uh, this is the, the actual uh, application running. Um, uh, this is the MRA. Uh, Seo has uploaded a series of photos. Um, he's logging into Google, and you can see the cat pictures and, uh, and penguins that he has uh, uploaded into the system. All right. So for anybody that is interested in learning more about how to build these, these types of network architectures, we have a, uh, a training tomorrow where we will teach you uh, and have you walk through the process of building the proxy model, the router mesh, and then finally the fabric model um, using the tools that we provide to automate and make that process easier. So if you're interested, uh, see the, the, the booth at the back, and, and we'll add you to the list. Thank you.